Hi, I'm Mac McCarthy, and I help people with their breakups. And today, we're going to talk about man's search for meaning, which is a classic, classic book. I believe it was written in 1946. I could be wrong. Um, it's been a uh, new edition, new edition many, many times. If you like this video, throw me a like. If you don't like the video, that's just fine. It's better to have an opinion. But I think... This book would really serve you in any moment where you need to consider reframing your interpretation of the events, and that applies to a lot of breakups. So today, uh, in Man's Search for Meaning, the book review, what's up, David? Um, if you haven't read this book, it's not a long read. It's what I would call simplistic reading. It makes a lot of sense, uh, and I think it would be required reading for human beings overall because – uh, the story and what what it brings to light. And I'm not talking about the Nazi prison camps or anything like that. It's, it's a bit deeper than that. I think that the idea behind this is to find meaning in everything that affects your feelings, your emotions. And basically when outcomes don't look good, don't look right, and you're, you feel like everything is against you, you got to find a meaning to keep showing up and keep going. And so he's actually – done this in a Nazi prison camp. And so it holds a lot of weight. And the book is written in a way that, like I said, anyone could read it. I feel like a lot of people, I, I'm a big fan of real stories. Haven't read, but read a summary. Should I read the whole thing? I, I believe so. Or listen to the audio book. I, I really liked, I like the idea that he had Logos therapy, which Logos means finding meaning. Kyle, it's really good to hear from you, but I hope you're well. See, The 12 Rules of Life by Jordan Peterson to me was a book i didn't finish it actually but to me if you've read enough self improvement and different things it was reinterpret it was it was recrafted lessons from from other books that doesn't mean that jordan peterson just copied people it was just the way he portrayed those lessons now getting back to this book i do have some notes uh like i said Kyle, i would just say this would be a top 10 book for any human being um like i said the reason being is it's not difficult to understand where he's going where he's coming from because of his experience but mac i read can't hurt me and it's incredible i can't recommend it enough on audible can't hurt me is by who sean cheeto your video response is on the way buddy i did it today in the forest in the jungle i got a funny story about that let me get into the book review so man search for meaning mr victor franco might be kind of a funny name for Victor Frankel. Uh, I'm going to just, like I said, I'm actually going to be launching a book review YouTube channel pretty soon. And so I'm going to share these notes with you that I've already come across. During the Holocaust in the 1940s, Victor Frankel spent three years as a prisoner in the Auschwitz. And da correct me if I've said this wrong, da da Chow concentration camp. His wife, father, mother, and brother died in these camps. He faced hunger debilitating and brutal living conditions. But unlike other prisoners around him, he managed to find hope and meaning during one of the most catastrophic, catastrophic events in human history. Let's take a look at the lessons we got of one of the most influential books in the world. The book had sold over 10 million copies and had been translated into 24 languages. Lesson number one. And let me know in the live stream. I'm not going to go through this book the whole live stream, but let me know what you find to be the best lesson and like I said, this is only going to be about five minutes. So bear with me here. If this isn't what you came to the live stream for. Uh, something new I'm trying. So he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Franco had a fellow inmate who shared a dream he had in 1945. This inmate had a voice that told him he could wish for anything in his dream. I've never had a dream like this. So he wished when he would be when he would be liberated from the consecration camp and end his suffering. The voice said, March 30th. The inmate had a strong sense of hope, was convinced that the voice was right. Time was moving on and the war was getting worse, appearing that freedom was unlikely. On March 29th, the inmate fell ill and lost consciousness on the 30th, the day he expected to be free. He died on March 31st. Frankel expressed the ultimate cause of his friend's death was the expected liberation. 
It did not come, and he was severely disappointed. It suddenly reduced his body's resistance to the late, latent typhus infection. His faith in the future, listen to me on this, because if you're in a breakup right now, his faith in the future and his will to live had become paralyzed, and his body gave into the illness. Thus, the voice in that dream was right all along. To back up the case, the chief doctor of the concentration camp witnessed an increased death rate of prisoners between Christmas 1944 and New Year's 1945. The doctor believed this was due to prisoners having false hope that they would be home again by Christmas. As this time drew near, many lost hope and fell into an unending rest. But what can we learn from this? Frankel said any attempt to restore a man's inner strength in the camp had first succeed in showing him some future goal whenever there was an opportunity for it. One had to give them a why and aim for their lives in order to strengthen them to bear the terrible how of their existence. Basically, the prisoners who found a reason to live had a stronger will to live and a chance of coming out alive, and those without a reason to keep going increased their likelihood of a severe illness and death. Frankel goes on to describe two prisoners who were contemplating suicide. They used the typical argument that they had nothing more to expect from life, but they didn't commit suicide. Why? Because they found meaning, a reason to keep going. For one, it was his child waiting for him in a foreign country. The other guy was a scientist who had written a series of books which still needed to be finished. A man who becomes conscious of the responsibility he bears towards a human being affectionately waits for him or to or to an unfinished work will never be able to throw away his life. He knows the why for his existence will be able to bear almost any and how I'm going to check in with you. Now, how does this, how does this correlate with you being in a breakup right now? The interesting part, I'm going to, I'm going to break that lesson down in two parts. Number one, this is where sometimes I'll tell you to go 30 days no contact or sometimes I'll say – and I want to stress that I would never tell you to do 30 days of no contact because that would there would be some kind of treat or guarantee at the end. It's just a finish line for you to stick with something for a certain amount of time. Now, here's the thing that people have a problem with is they create – well, if she doesn't come back in two weeks, she'll never come back. Um, if – they create these narratives and these stories that limit them. And so you need to find a why or a reason that the breakup happened that you can accept. Notice I didn't say you that you're going to jump in glee and you're going to be all happy. That would be total horseshit. Okay. You need to find something that you can accept it. Then – form some kind of goal, some kind of future thing that you're living for outside of that breakup that's much more bigger than her if or him. And that should be the thing that you're coming back to. Okay. If you're having a lot of trouble with that, book a live coaching session with myself and maybe we can unpack those things. So let me get back to this. Lesson number two, love is the ultimate highest goal to which man can aspire. I would say uh, unconditional love would be uh, more specific. Frankel emphasized that everyone's meaning is completely unique and that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which a man can aspire. It was one of man's love for his child that kept him pushing forward for another. It was sharing his findings with the world through books. For Frankel himself, it was his love for his wife that kept him going. He realized the power of love on a cold, dark day where he finds where he and his inmates were commanded to march out to work site. They, the emaciated prisoners were beaten and forced to trudge over stones and icy terrain. One, eight, one inmate whispered to Franco, if our wives could see us now, I do hope they are better off in their camps and don't know what is happening to us. Upon reflecting on this time and past, Franco said, I did not know my wife was alive and I had no means of finding out. But at that moment, it ceased to matter. There was no need for me to know. Nothing could touch the strength of my love, my thoughts, and the image of my beloved. Had I known that my wife was dead, I think that I would still have given myself undisturbed by that knowledge to the contemplation of her image 
and that my mental conversation with her would have been just as vivid and just as satisfying. So what he's saying here, had she passed away, he still would have been able to communicate with her in his own way. Lesson three, when we are no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. This is what I would say that you need to consider if you're at the ground zero of a breakup, you're in month two, month three. When, you, when we no longer are able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Franco was a clinical psychiatrist before he was put in a concentration camp. He once had a client with severe depression. This client could not overcome the loss of his wife who died two years ago. Frankel asked what would happen if he had died instead and his wife would have had to survive. The client said it would have been terrible for her. She would have to suffer. Let me tell you something. This is definitive reframing and interpretation of events. This man's suffering. He misses his wife. His wife passed away. He's in complete pain. But the idea that maybe, maybe he could look at it in a different way that if he had been the one that died first, his wife would be in the pain. So maybe he did her a favor or she was done a favor by not suffering and missing him. Frank, Frankel replied, such a suffering has been spared and it was you who have spared her this suffering. The client said nothing, shook his hand and walked out of the clinic. Frankel said, in some way, suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. Of course, this was not a therapy in a proper sense, since first, his despair was no disease, and second, I could not change his fate. I could not revive his wife. But in that moment, I did succeed in changing his attitude toward his unfaltered fate. This is something I try to do when I do breakup coaching. This is something I do when I talk to you in a live coaching session. If someone's on a live stream right now uh, that I've done a coaching session with, I hope you can relate to that in our session. Think about it. But in that moment, I did succeed in changing his attitude to, toward his unalterable fate, and he can now at least see a meaning in his suffering. As of today, many people have found meanings in their lives. Some things in life are inevitable. The loss of loved ones, terminal is forgotten memories. Man's search for meaning challenges us so that we cannot avoid suffering, but we can choose how to cope with it. Find meaning in it and move forward. So let me get into this live stream. One of the greatest uh, situations, well, not the greatest, but this is just one that I, I remember. Let's not make it so dramatic here. But I had a client years back, a couple years back, and she had a divorce. They were together for years, got married, and Hurricane Katrina hit. I don't know if you guys remember this huge hurricane in New Orleans. And she said during this hurricane, uh, they lost, I, I believe they lost their house. And his, I, I believe it was his parents and his grandparents had lost their house in some way. Everyone was living together. Everyone, it was like ground zero for everyone. And she had looked back and she was like, our marriage was just that week number two. And we were, we were in a total um, emergency. And so she felt like her marriage was affected by this natural disaster. And the fact that they had to take her, his grandparents in and his parents in and take care of them really fucked up her marriage. And she was bitter about it. And I said, hey, look. I said, you couldn't control that natural disaster, but I'll tell you what, as a human being, I don't know when it's going to come, 50, 60 years, or whatever it is, but on your deathbed, you'll never regret taking in someone's grandparents and parents during a hurricane. You did the human thing. You did the right thing. You were a good person in that moment. And she just, it was like, whew. she had never looked at it that way. And I said, do you regret helping out his grandparents during Hurricane Katrina and having them live in your house? She said, no. I said, would you turn them away because you thought your marriage would last longer when they had no home? No. She's like, I just never looked at it that way. I said, well, put, give yourself a pat on the back for stepping up and being a good human being when someone was in need. And if that affected your marriage later on, I still think you did the right thing. That's a reframe of an interpretation of events that you looked at in a completely negative victim type way. And then when you reframed it, you're like, oh shit. Actually, I just looked at that. A lot of this stuff that goes down, you create a narrative, you create a story, 
And if it's, if it's affecting you in a negative, bad way, can you reframe the narrative? Has there been a time in your life where you were looking at something completely uh, in a harsh, unserving way to your future and somehow you were able to turn it around? A good one would be if someone said something about your weight. There's a lot of people in the world that have trouble with their weight. I've had, I think one time in my life, quote unquote, someone was like, are you starting to get fat? Right. And this is like if someone out there is listening to this and they're like, oh, I'm overweight, this, that, and the other. If someone makes a comment to you and you feel like you're massively overweight, and this isn't for people that are like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm so big, but they're actually really skinny. No. I'm saying if that kind of a comment, someone says, hey, you're getting fat. Or let's just say, how about this one? Some little kid in the park goes, hey, look at the fat lady, right? And you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you said that to me. That was so rude. That was so inconsiderate. At that moment right there, that could be a definitive moment where you go, you know what? I need to go on a diet if a little kid affects me that much with their comments. You know what? I'm going to start going and exercising and handle this shit. I don't want to feel this way forever. That's taking something negative and using it as fuel moving forward. The other part of this is when you're in a breakup, you need a definitive goal moving forward. Has anyone wants to share out of their breakup that they've come away with something that they they've had a past breakup, maybe not the fresh breakup. You look back at the past breakup and you're like, oh shit, if I would have stayed with that individual, this wouldn't have happened. If I would have the the worst breakup I've ever had, I was at ground zero. I thought it was hell and back, all that kind of stuff. I would have never become a breakup coach had it not happened. And this is a great thing for myself. And I would have never moved to Thailand and lived on a tropical beach. There's a lot of good things that came later on. So let me get into this. Oh, Johnny, David Jeffers, always a pleasure. Leandra, thank you. Philip, Kyle, how have you been? Please let me know. How's the football career? But Mac, Sabina, always a pleasure. But Mac, I can't read. I read Can't Hurt Me, and it is incredible. I can't recommend it enough on all, but I've heard good things about it. Sabina, hope you're well. Uh, yes, thanks, David. All oh, bup, 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 bup. how are you guys? I'm good. David Goggins. Da 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 David Banner. <laughs> Can't hurt me is my David Goggins. Uh huh. We have Victor Franco's Institute Museum too here in Vienna. Cool. Very cool. Uh, anyway, this isn't much helpful because we have too many depressive people here. What do you mean this isn't very helpful? The book review? Uh, incredible. Once you expect your breakup and put goals in place for your life and keep working towards them, you realize you only need yourself to be happy. I believe entanglements affect relationships and they have nothing to do with yourself. Yeah, that's actually a chapter in my, in my book is entanglements are going to be big. I think that we're constantly battling entanglements. and I think you've never had more entanglements than now in, um, 2020, Constructive criticism, take it on board positively or negatively. Attitude, if you're true to yourself, you'll take it the right way. Um, you got to be in the right place. I, I'll tell you this. I've been um, – I've taken criticism the wrong and the right way, and it, it, it definitely um, can be something that helps you and it can be something that hurts you. Sometimes talking to people – unearth some things that you don't know that were there. And that's why it's therapeutic to do therapy. And what, what people don't realize you need, when you talk to someone like myself or you talk to a therapist and you talk for an hour, two hours, it really takes time for you to let loose. You get 10 minute snippets. It doesn't work the same. Does anyone have any open questions at this point in the live stream? We've got five on deck and five likes. I appreciate it. Thank you. Kindly. Is there a book that you feel like, that would be a book that would help you through a breakup that, you know, that being said, I don't know if this is the book. Some, everyone's different. Everyone's different. A lot of people say, I don't like to read. I don't like, you know, okay. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about a breakup is sometimes you change 3% man. Do you want me to do a review on that? I've done a review on that. It's actually on my channel. 3% man is an extremely simply written book. You can read it 10 times. 
it's okay. I mean, uh, I don't have anything negative to say about it. Is there something compelling in the book that really had me have some feeling? There's a point by point book on attraction, women and men. I'm saying a book that would help with a break of 3%, man. You read that book like 10 times, didn't you? And you're saying that that book would help you in a way to understand attraction and, and for a man to understand how to interact with a woman better, correct? How to say when you talk to yourself by Shad Helmstetter? Is it what to say when you talk to yourself or is it how to say? Um, I haven't read that. I have looked at the book review, I think, on Joseph Rodriguez's channel. I do believe it, it's – Chanchito, it's uh, absolutely ironic because I did a video response for you today. And at the end of the video response, I talk about that, about how to talk to yourself. That's so fucking random, dude. It's weird how the universe works sometimes because at the end of the video, um, which I'll probably have to you by, by the morning. Just got to get it uploaded. Um, I, I tell you, you got to reverse that, that voice in your head. I think that's one of the most underrated things, uh, that people overlook when they're going through a breakup or any negative point in their life is redirecting that little jerk mouse on a wheel in your head, just telling you the same negative things over and over again and getting a hold of them and going, shut up, stop. Right. Because it's, it's difficult when you have that reoccurring thing. Yeah, 3% man was definitely not. Let's go through these as a as a lesson really quick. He who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. So I was doing good. Then I stopped and got back to square one. It happens, Chanchito. You're human, bro. The reason it happened to ground zero is you're doing the same things and you're in the same situation with the same circumstances. Uh, it's a difficult situation, but the good news for you is you've got some kind of finish lines involved that you know are coming. And those, those will be judgment days for your relationship. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why am I going to make it through this breakup? Or that you've been through worse or that you're going to come out of this better than ever. Kyle, are you still on deck? I'd be really curious to see where you're at. Kyle, Kyle wouldn't mind me telling, I mean, this is the Kyle I'm thinking of from England. It took him a while, man. And he was doing all the right things. I think what people underrate is it takes time. It takes time to heal. It takes a lot of time to heal. It really can't be overlooked. Tomorrow on the show, because this has been, we got six on deck with five likes. Tomorrow we got an interesting topic. Hypergamy. With Jessica, a female that had never heard of the term before. So I think that's all. What about this? Where in your life, let me ask you this question. We've got five on deck, five likes. I know we just had a disconnection there for a moment. Where, 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 where in your life have you had failure or rejection and you came out of it? Whether that was a breakup, whether that was a job, whether that was... Uh, failing a class, and he came out of it. Why do you think it's so much harder with a breakup than any other thing? Is it personal? Is it the fact that it surprised you? Uh, we can do another session. Just go to rightmac.com and sign it up, Philip. I'm here for you, bud. You asking me to do another session right now? <laughs> um, sign up for the – do the – check the times and pay the moolah, and we're in. In like Flynn. Um, but why, why do you think that certain breakups hurt more than others and that you find less meaning in them? I, I think the ones that hurt you are the ones you don't see coming – or, or the ones that really hurt is when you go, I, your feelings were at a hundred and their feelings were at 60 and you're like, what happened? Because you are a hundred percent emotionally attached with that other person. You know, that's not true of everyone. Not everyone I would say is a hundred percent emotionally attached. Mm. I definitely couldn't say I'm 100% emotionally attached in all my relationships, 100%. Mm. 
Mind Sight by Daniel J. Siegel. It, it's about emotional and social intelligence, how we can rewire our brains. Okay. When you connect to your inner self, you will find meaning. That's a pretty deep thing to say. How did you do that? Would be my question, Chris B. Uh, when someone says something like that, I'm interested to know, like, how did you connect to your inner self and find meaning? I know during a breakup that I had, one of the ways the one of the ways I've always done it um, is getting time alone, uh, walks in nature. Um, I think that those are the things that help me get in touch with your inner self and find meaning. I invented a toy, spent some good money on it, and it failed. It did not bother me anywhere as much as this break. Huh. That's kind of random. I think that what happens when the through meditation and contemplation, journaling, I suppose, if I may ask. Because a lot of people will say, oh, I, I can't meditate. I just can't do it. A good thing to do after your meditation is what do I need to know? Ask yourself that question when your mind's really quiet. What do I need to know right now? What do I need to know right now? I remember I read that in a book, a Louise Hay book, and I came back to that quite a bit. And it was like, you're going to get through this. You're going to be okay. When you get closer and closer to your soul, you will feel ultimate happiness. You ask for mother letdowns in our life. It's to compare it to other. So the mother letdown was the toy failure. Hmm. Interesting. I've talked about it before. My One of my biggest letdowns was getting cut from a basketball team when I was a freshman in high school. That was just – and the reason it hurt, I didn't see it coming. And I think that those are the breakups where people go, we're good together. We got a lot going. We have years invested. We like The people that really have trouble, they're like, I can't believe they can't see it the way I'm seeing it. And it just doesn't make reasonable sense. I just had a private video response today. This was this story that I, I'm not going to divulge the details completely because it was a private video response. But this this guy was with this woman for under two years, but they were they were proposed. They were in their early 40s. They had both had kids. They lived together. She proposed to him. I mean, every I, I got halfway through a story and I'm like, look, I'm confused. One day she said she was annoyed. He said, what the hell is this all about? kind of lost his cool one thing led to the next they separated for five days da -de da -de da but then the amazing thing was is like she broke up with him and said she wasn't right like it went from i'm annoyed with you to we've had an argument let's get some space let's revisit things maybe we need to postpone the wedding to i want you to move out and i don't want to talk to you again i'm not attracted to you it's like what He's like, what do I, he's like, I didn't even see this coming. Um, and I, I can't say I've had one of those. Other letdowns, not mother letdowns. <laughs> I got cut from a special selection at work and I was destroyed. Now I'm still working on it after two years and I will try it again. Yeah, I mean, it's, and you probably felt, like you were qualified and that you could do it. And so um, I had a project as a teacher at the university where I told students to think about the greatest moment in life. And, and then we charted the feelings and the things that a lot of them had in common. And the greatest moment usually involves surprise. It was a surprising moment. A lot, a, there was a, there was a probably a 10 percentile of people that said a surprise birthday party was one of their greatest moments in life. Interesting. If you ever want to do a surprise birthday for someone there, people are very touched by them. So surprise was big. And, and we charted this because I was curious. Um, what is, first of all, ask yourself, what's your greatest moment in life? Whatever comes up first, don't overthink it because it could be multiple things, but whatever comes up in your mind is, is probably what's first. That being said, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, when my child was born, I've heard that before, okay? I was dealing with university students, none of them had kids. So, um, or that I know of. 
So a lot of them, but then I said, well, what was the feeling that was evident? What was this or that? Surprise was up there. Recognition by a crowd or a group was high on the list. So winning a contest of some sort was very, very high uh, as part of their greatest moment. So I, like I said, recognition of your peers and, and camaraderie, you know, winning a spelling bee or something like that. That's, that was very high on some people's list. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, what's the opposite of your lowest moment? Shame. Uh, rejection, uh, but also surprise. I think that surprise with rejection and shame hits just as hard. So when you didn't see it coming, I guess you didn't brace for the, for the impact. Writing poetry can help. We all need to express emotions. Internalizing and holding them in can be counterintuitive. I think writing or journaling is great. You don't, you know, I think that that's, that's great. Um, it, can, it definitely is a way to get everything out of your head, right? For sure. I did, I, I, I wrote probably three or four journals during my ground zero moments of my breakup, for sure. For sure. Um, but you, one of the biggest things you're going to have to do during your breakup at some point is start to take a self-assessment of who you are as an individual and where you want to head. And then hopefully you can extract something from that assessment of where you're at and who you are right now in life and come up with something that's going to drive you that's outside of your ex. That's really outside of your ex. Because the, re the reality is you're capable of meeting someone else. Yeah, suppressing is never a good way to deal with it. <clears throat> I feel like this book review today wasn't a heavy hitter for many of you. Really, really didn't go over big with the live stream so far. You guys are going to, people are going to come out in the droves for the hyper Grammy tomorrow. What do you think, how about this question for you? What do you think the one thing... When you're really feeling anxious and worried if your ex is going to come back, if you're ever going to feel good again, what do you think the one thing you can always go to that will help you out? For you as an individual, you want to share that? What's going to really help you out? No answers today. This group today is low. I believe I'm a great individual successful man. I know her loss, but it still hurts. Exercising is probably number one. <clears throat> Let's unpack this real quick, Chanchito, because I know where you're at and what your, what your situation is. I won't share it all, but what's the biggest thing that hurts? What's the, Talking to close pe people close to you will be thankful for that. Not everyone has people that they're close to, but I would agree. That's something I don't talk about a lot, but I did have some people that I could lean on that surprised me. Uh, and they were there for me and made a real effort. And surprise, surprise, the people that made the biggest effort and they were there for me the most were people that had been through breakups themselves. And I had disregarded, I knew they had, had breakups before, but I had just disregarded that it was that painful on them. And they were like, whoa, wait a minute, dude. Like, I know what you're going through. Those are the people that really step up usually because they've been through a situation. Their breakup might not be the same, but they know the feelings. They know the feelings. And get back to the, get back to the things that would be the ultimate, most exciting thing that you could do. What's always, this is another one that I've asked people before. What's always been knocking at your door? Like I've always wanted to be a football coach at a university. I always wanted to be, what's always been knocking at your door? Kimberly Lusby, good AM. My ex has came back. And he calls me every day as painful as it was. I'm comfortable not going back. Why are you, why are you taking the calls? My ex has came back and he calls me every day as painful as it was. I'm comfortable not going back. Is, I mean, if you don't want him back, 
I'm just curious. Do you do you entertain the calls to comfort him, or do you, you know? I haven't had a situation where an ex has pestered me to come back. You know, like when she calls every day and gets a no. Um, do you find it pathetic or do you find it pitiful? How do you deal with that, Kimberly? What Coach Mack has taught me and to assess my life, set some goals, accept a break and move forward. All of these are very hard. And I now know, but no contact is not truly to get your ex back, but to it is to get yourself back, dude. It, it really is. And as a bonus, you might get your ex back. I think the ones that sting the most are the situation where you didn't do anything wrong. You know, the amount of times I've told people you didn't do anything wrong, not all, not all the time, but those are situations where you cannot get down on your knees and beg someone back or say sorry or get them flowers. Those are situations where you got to go, I don't think I did anything wrong here. It's a timing and circumstances situation. This individual is being honest with me. They're just not that into it. The answer isn't that the pain's going to go away or the rejection feeling is going to go away. It'll slowly dissipate at times. But what's the alternative to beg for that person to change their mind? <laughs> As an adult, is there anything that you should be begging for? I blocked his calls so his messages go to my voicemail and he writes me letters and mail them to my house and leaves flowers on my car. So did he do something wrong? Do you think it's more of a shot up to at egos, the rejection aspects in those situations? Uh, depends on the individual. A lot of times for men it is. Uh, but a woman, a woman that, that feels that she's attractive uh, or feels like she has a lot going for her, if she's rejected, sh sh it'll be an ego blast. Sure. It depends on how an individual regards themselves. So I think that, Think about it this way, Dave. It's a good question, by the way. Thanks for bringing up an interesting <laughs> question. I thought we were, we were waning there for a minute. Um, just, uh, bear with me here. People say, oh, this person has a big ego, right? I, I think about it in uh, buckets, like I said, I've said before. Well, someone could have a big ego about music if they're a DJ. In other words, like they, they know about sound equipment, that they know about this, and so – if someone comes around them that's you know, mediocre with that kind of knowledge, they can have a big ego about it. But there's definitely different areas of your life that your ego is going to be lower based on the fact that you're not good at something or you don't know a whole lot about it. And I think the older you get, you can deal with that. But yes, I think what's hard, and this is what was hard in the breakup I've talked about before in my own life, and I've seen it with other people. When someone seems like they're not just into you, but they're all in and they, they love you and it's genuine, it's real, and then they don't, it's almost like, hey, what happened? Like, is it just that easy for you not to love? The answer is for some people, love is different for them. The circumstances are different. And yeah, I, Love is never going to be defined by Webster's Dictionary. Love is never going to be defined by your definition of love. Attraction is never going to be defined by your definition of attraction. It's going to be defined by the individual. And so when someone goes, oh, they don't know how to love someone. No, they don't know how to love you the way you want to be loved. If you have someone say, oh, this person is not a hard worker, I can't be with them. No, they're not, they're not working as hard as you see fit as an individual. That's deep. When you, can, when you can grab a hold of something like that, then you can come to grips with the idea that your individual opinion is – right now, especially in the world, all, there's, a, there's a large faction of people out there that believe their opinion is the opinion of everyone else. Uh, they, you know, Someone will be like, we – they or us and the reality is it's you and that's your opinion 
Rolo says that women will never love a man the way a man wants to be loved. I mean, that's that's a broad statement. I remember, I read that recently because I'm I'm doing notes for a book review, and that's one of those ones. That's Rolo's experience, and that's where he's coming from, and that's fine. It's his opinion. Uh, do I think that's absolutely 100% true? No, because each individual man has a little inch. There. <laughs> He, humans are a little int more intricate than like, oh, all humans do this. All humans do that. It's like all humans. If you told me what, what do all humans need? Eat, sleep, eat, sleep, and drink water. We all need that. And then you ask yourself, well, what do they need to eat? And you get different answers from different humans. The reality is we do need to drink water. We do need to sleep. How much sleep do you need to get? Well, everyone gets a different amount. How much water do you need to drink? That's debatable. Like, like this stuff gets deeper and deeper and deeper. When we were together, he was upset that I did not marry him within six months of dating him. So he left me and moved in, moved to another state. He came back and you gave, and you gave him a chance, but then he threatened to leave me. So I dumped him for good. It has never, it has been a year since that's absolutely ridiculous behavior in an adult relationship too use whenever someone wants to use dumping to get their way highly immature uh i never use the term narcissistic very often but that sounds narcissistic and selfish and that would be one of those situations i wouldn't walk i would run if any individual was like using the idea that i'll dump you if you don't do what i ask let alone getting married is absolutely atrocious i believe is ego in my case coming from a latin culture where the man is everything well, that's being mindful. Here's the thing about culture and identifying with culture. Now that you know you're identifying with a bit of culture, uh, and that, and here's the thing, maybe that maybe that's what makes you attractive to her. Okay, maybe you like your culture in that way, and I think that's fine. Um, your your. Your situation is very unique. You have a set of circumstances, Chanchito, that are, are not in your favor. You're in a long-distance relationship where someone is in an environment and a freedom to do what they want and interact and party and mingle with the opposite sex regularly, and you're in a situation where you don't have those same opportunities. And so if the roles were reversed, if the roles were reversed – would you, would you be acting the way you want her to act? Good question. Not interested in getting her back. I didn't do anything wrong. Her entanglements won't ever change. Philip, I know your situation, and I agree a thousand percent, not a hundred percent. It's easy to say it's still going to hurt. You were with that woman for a long time, but that's clarity. That statement you just made. You're you're a hundred percent correct. Hundred percent correct. And the entanglements. I talk about entanglements a lot. How many entanglements do we have in our lives that affect us, right? If you've ever had college roommates and they got problems, oh, I can't pay my rent this month, sorry. I've had those before. It's like, oh, shit, now I'm going to have to come up with double money. I'm going to have to bleed my savings. Neighbors are entanglements. Coworkers are entanglements. If you, if you ever hear a writer interviewed, one of the number one things a writer says, and this is probably one of the reasons I haven't written my book yet completely, I've written bits and pieces of different things, is that you need to isolate. You need to take away all the entanglements and distractions because you have to sit down and literally construct uh, and crystallize thoughts. I think mine is ego as well, since I'm successful in a lot of aspects, not to sound conceited and I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, no, that's confidence, dude. That's not conceited. Um, the reason, <laughs> David, the reason why you're successful in a lot of aspects is because you believe that about yourself. Belief is probably the paramount thing that the human being carries that creates who you are and what you're about. It all starts, it's the, it's the core root of everything you're good at and bad at is your beliefs. And so if you believe you're a piece of shit and you're a liar and this and that, then you're going to make that true over and over again. If you believe you're good at this, this, and this, and you might even think like, I'm a catch, man. I'm good looking. I'm this, I'm that. And then when this, this woman that you were with smacks you in the face, basically puts you in a situation where you're like, wow, maybe I have to question that one. Just remember this. 
if it was if you were playing a sport and you lost the race, it would hurt, but you'd get back in another race. So what's the answer? At some point, you're going to get back in the race of dating. David agreed. That's why I have peace in my heart. I know I did my best and anything wrong. And that's how you have to look at it, Chanchito. It hurts. It's not, it's not a great feeling. It's not a great feeling. And that's what, what really makes, um, I think, no contact difficult for people that are quote-unquote go-getters or hard workers. Is they're like, oh, shit, I mean, if I work harder at this. Or, I mean, there was a guy I was coaching a year ago. He just kept going to the lady's door and offering gifts. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why do you keep doing this? I mean, and and I had to tell him, like, he's like, do you think she's going to come back? No, not at this point. You've gone to her house, you know, four different times in two weeks, and you're not listening. Also, I've been dating someone new recently, Mac, but not trying to rush into anything. Well, go for you. Go on bad dates. Expect less. Start dating. Start start putting yourself out there. Oh, this girl doesn't seem like she's, you know, well, go out with her. Just go have a good time. Practice. Right? It's like people, <laughs> oh, that would be messed up to practice. How are you going to know you like someone? Getting back out and dating. If you meet, let's let's say David Jeffers meets the one, the soulmate, which I don't believe in, but I do believe that there's multiple ones out there that could be good matches for you. The problem is, is they're not around every corner. You don't meet them every 10 minutes. They come and go, and they come in bunches a lot of times, and a lot of times they find you when you're at your best. When you're at your best, you also still want to be able to go, oh, yeah, I've been taking some swings at the plate. I hit a couple singles and a double. Now I want to fucking smack a home run. Well, if you just got up to the plate the first time and you haven't played ball in like a year, and then you're like, all right, I'm gonna, you're not, you're not, you're probably not going to hit very well. And so you literally have to, like I say, go on bad dates, go out with women, associate with them, read up on attraction, do those kinds of things, get yourself active. And then it's like, oh, I recently started dating someone. She seems cool, cool. I'm not expecting too much. Cool, date another woman. I don't have a problem with that. I, I do, for me personally, if you've been in a long relationship, I do think that you probably want to be single for a little while and not jump into a new relationship right away. If anything else, don't you want to enjoy being single for a little while? I mean, don't you want to feel what that's like if you haven't been single in a while? Someone was asking me today, and I might do a, a video on this, that he, he's been off the radar for two years. And before, he used to be kind of a pickup artist. And he was like, I'm starting to get the itch that, like, subconsciously, like, maybe it's time for me to start talking to some women. And he's like, I've actually been asked out three times in the last few months, and one didn't show up, and this and that. And I was like, I was like, why is it that you're waiting for women to ask you out? Because this guy, he's not a celebrity. Uh, but he's got status, okay? And so I'm sure within his group, he's got some status in some different ways. And so I guess women want to go out with him. And like I said, I was like, so you're putting yourself in a situation that you're interested in dating, and the way you're entertaining that is way, is having women ask you out within, within mutual groups? I said, why aren't you going on offense a little bit? I've been thinking and I want to keep some some key to keep spinning plates for a while. I'm the thing about spinning plates is it takes work and you're going to have to deal with some shit and you're going to have some women pissed off at you that you, you know, that you aren't interested in they're interested. So it, 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 it takes some maneuvering. Uh, but at the end, end of the day, women spin plates too. When I get out here, I will date all of them. My Tinder is already searching the upcoming location. You're going to be just fine, dude. You know that. You know that for sure. You know that for sure. All right, folks, we've got seven on deck, seven likes. Does anyone have any closing questions? I'm at 54 minutes. We're going to talk about hypergamy tomorrow, 11 a.m. Indochina time.
is 823, 2023 right now. Where I'm at. And started out a little slow with the book review. Maybe that's something you guys don't really enjoy or the topic of man search for meaning. Maybe it's simplified to you. Maybe you're like, oh, I can find meaning in everything. Sometimes I will say this too, that you, when we talk about how you talk to yourself, Chanchito, come up with some questions to ask yourself. Like you ask yourself those questions and the first thing that comes up is the answer that your subconscious is holding. Thanks, Kimberly, for those kind words. I appreciate it, man. Online profiles. Well, that's a funny chapter in the rational mail, correct? Should I respond when she texts? In your case, Chanti, it's your choice. I'm not going to tell you to do that or not do that. What, I mean, your situation is, and I, why don't? But why don't I tell you what to do? Because you want to know the answer. There's no wrong answer. Okay, with your situation, well, I know that's not what you're looking for, right? You're not going to change the circumstances. You guys are in a long distance relationship. You want to make sure she doesn't see someone else, but her behavior and the environment she's hanging out with are putting her in dicey situations where you have to ask, have you been sleeping with someone? And then she gets annoyed. You're, you're, it's like a dog chasing its tail. And then she texts you. She misses you. Um, my answer would say, if you want to get her attention and you want to, you want to put yourself in a position of caring less about the relationship and see where she really stands. I wouldn't respond. That would be you playing, playing to win rather than not to lose. But on the flip side, if you guys want to keep play this back and forth, back and forth, um, I think it's fine. I think that there is, like I said, for you, when you guys get into contact with each other, it's going to be great. The reality is if you sniff out that she's been with a couple other people and you want to keep asking those questions because you can't deal with that, well, then that's always going to be a problem. Online profiles. That's not something I know a whole lot about, but I'll definitely – I think we touched on it with Jessica, who's been on some dating apps. Um, and she was actually laughing to me about some of these guys that are um, buff with tattoos and, like, like going like this with their, you know, muscles and stuff. And I was like, but on the flip side – some women like that. I mean, there's a friend of mine that I've known for years that has a professional photographer do his Instagram. He said he just kills it on Instagram. He meets women all the time. He pro the guy probably buys likes or whatever that is or followers. I don't know. He's got quite a bit of money. His Instagram has like really cool pictures and stuff like that. And he has no shame about it. And he said it works for meeting women. Okay. Um, but you're, I mean, what would be the what would be the ideal thing to meet someone online through you know dating profile? I don't know. I think though that chapter in Rational Mail is absolutely hilarious about dating profiles. That's probably one of the best. If I'm going to do that topic, which I think I will do, since two of you had suggested it, um, I'll I'll touch on that Rational Mail one because I think that's absolutely funny. That. Um, the narrative in dating profiles tends to be a woman could ask for all these different things, but if a guy asked for what he really wanted, he'd be a chauvinist. When you're aligned with yourself, you are content. You know what I find with this, um, people's quest for uh, happiness and being content, I think it's moment to moment. I think there's moments that you're aligned. I think there's moments that things piss you off. I just came home. I was at the beach, had a great day, great sundown, met some friends for dinner, um, had a great hike today, beautiful day. I mean, thankful for a lot. And where I live next to my house is an entrance to a really nice uh, resort or hotel. And there's a huge gate up. And right now, since COVID, there's, there's no um, – security guard there sometimes and now with all the people delivering food people just 
hammer the fucking horn. And it's right on the side of my like side of my entrance. And I had this great day. I'm lying. <laughs> Everything's aligned for me, Chris B. Uh, I'm content. I'm happy. I'm feeling great. I just saw the sun go down. It's 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 tremendous. I'm like fuck. I come running down the stairs. I said, "Hey, it's this little old Thai lady." She's like, "Huh?" She's delivering food. I said, "Stop the horn. That's my house." It's like, "Oh, sorry." So even though I, even though you know. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying what you said was wrong, but I'm just saying we have these moments where you're like, yeah, everything was right. And then I got this person just fucking hammering a horn, oblivious that it's to the side of my house. And then they come, oh, sorry. It's like, yeah, you rang your fucking horn nine times in front of my house. You know, it's a lot like, what's going on? Could you call the person at the gate? And so I, I think that sometimes we get lost in this idea that, oh, you're just going to have moments. With, and then I come upstairs I'm like, why does that shit piss me off so much? Why can't I just let it go? Because I, I feel like I wouldn't do that to someone else. And it's, it, it's, it's an annoying sound. It's like today I went to, um, it does. Asking yourself good questions is highly underrated. Because in my head, I was just like, fuck. I don't even like getting angry about this. I got a great house, live in a great place. I should be, I should be more, uh, thankful in the sense that like and i'm like no anyone would get pissed with someone blaring a horn in front of their house and then you just have to let it go right that's the thing things like that you can get upset with but you're able to let them go better when you're in a good place i feel like all right folks it's been one hour it's been good it's been great it's been grand if you want to go to writemac.com and book a live coaching session go for it if you want to send in your full story i can do a private video response or a public video response if you have a topic you want me to touch on, please put it in the comments below. I will do that online profiles for um, David and Chan Cheeto. Otherwise, have a good one.